Many people were shocked this past week to hear that the federal government was using unidentified troops in full battle gear to kidnap protesters right off the streets of Portland, Oregon. Well, I wasn't shocked. That's how a state acts when it's in trouble. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. As you probably know by now, the U.S. government is mobilizing to quell the uprising that started with the murder of George Floyd at the hands of the police. And this past week in Portland, it's been reported grabbing protesters, throwing them in vans, taking them to cells and interrogating them without charge. As if declaring the Bill of Rights officially worthless, the acting Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security even said these tactics were, quote, common, and we should expect more of them in more cities as unrest grows. The FBI, Homeland Security, U.S. Marshals, and even Border Patrol, the DEA, and the ATF are all getting involved in this which shows us that what their official mandates say is irrelevant. They're not limited by scope. Their purpose is to instill fear and to control. To explain away their violence, Homeland Security put out a press release that you need to see, because it reads like a conservative blog. So... You know, for example, it talks about our brave law enforcement officers. <laughs> and uh, it's even got my favorite line anywhere. A federal courthouse is a symbol of justice. To attack it is to attack America. <laughs> right on. <laughs> like, like I can write political PR, but this sentence was just plain impressive. Uh, as you can see, it repeats violent anarchists over and over again. You can see uh, its justification here. Violent anarchists broke a window. Violent anarchists graffitied the courthouse. Then the next day, violent anarchists graffitied something else, and then more graffiti, and then lots of graffiti. Wow, that's violent. Then, next day, again, violent anarchist graffiti, graffiti, graffiti. Oh, my goodness. Oh, thank God the feds stepped in. That's all anyone can say. <laughs> um, it, it's great propaganda, this violent anarchists thing, it's a clear target for where to direct public blame. I didn't, I really didn't know graffiti was violent, personally, and, and I'm curious how they knew all those people were anarchists. Were they passing out copies of The Conquest of Bread? Basically, the state labeled all their enemies very simply violent anarchists, so it could get violent on them. There's been a disturbing but entirely predictable response from the right wing, everyone latching on to their favorite chosen excuse for why the state is justified in using its agents to hurt people that they don't like. They don't even know the people being kidnapped, they just trust the state to tell them who people are and what kind of punishment they deserve. Sure, it goes against everything they claim to believe in about freedom and rights and stuff, but, but those people are leftists and angry minorities, which means the state will find plenty of support for violence against them. Liberals, meanwhile, equally predictable, they just can't understand how the state could do something like this, because they continue to believe in illusions of progress and democracy, despite all evidence to the contrary. The biggest threat to any state comes from its domestic population, not from outside. If they, if citizens, gain consciousness and unite, they can overthrow the established order. 
But long before they do, the state starts fighting back. It makes propaganda every day, separating good citizens from bad people, or terrorists as we tend to call them nowadays, or maybe violent anarchists is the new label. It uses surveillance to keep an eye on anyone it thinks might be involved in anything contrary to its interests. And as we know from Edward Snowden, that's millions of people. It puts people in cages as punishment for not following its orders. And a lot of governments around the world do far worse. The U.S. is one of them. If you know the history of its foreign policy, you'll know it's engaged in mass murder, torture, and surveillance overseas for more than a century now. And whenever it's felt threatened, the state has brought that violence home to its citizens. It's easier, after all, to rule over a domestic population because far more people consider your rule legitimate. And it's much easier to find civilians to help you. At times like these, the state makes unofficial use of right-wing goons who, let's face it, can't wait to be unpaid purveyors of violence. Really, can you tell the difference? They all want to be the same people and do the same things. The most dangerous state is one under siege from its own citizens. Everything we're seeing now has been done before. The government is mobilizing federal troops to use domestically, like it did in the 1960s, and none of the so-called checks and balances are stopping it. This state has a well-documented recent history of torture all over the world. You don't think they'll bring that home too? If they haven't already? What about inciting riots? assassinating or disappearing people, bombing entire buildings. They've done all those things domestically before, too. And Trump has already said he's sending more troops to more cities and increasing funding to local police departments so they can hire hundreds more officers. Portland is just the beginning. Now, we know the U.S. has a long history of unbridled violence, but what about other countries? Would they ever do what we're seeing in the U.S.? Let's be clear about what the state is, okay? The purpose of the state is to establish and maintain a social order that benefits the ruling class at everyone else's expense. If that order is threatened, They'll raise the violence. I remember arguing with a friend of mine uh, over this a few years ago. He lives in Germany, and we were talking about the really horrible, brutal repression in Syria. At the time we were talking, there were these huge demonstrations in Germany and other parts of Europe, these peaceful marches with kind of vague goals, and my friend was saying that the German state would never crack down on them violently like was going on in Syria. But we don't know that, and I'm certainly not convinced. The demonstrations in Syria were a challenge to the legitimacy of the state. The demonstrations in Germany were pointless and did nothing to challenge the state. If those same people had been employing what's called a diversity of tactics, look it up, maybe kind of like the Gilets Jaunes are now doing in France, and they were unified in the goal of creating major, specific changes, the siege state would have crawled out of the swamp. They might have started beating and arresting people and breaking up protests that way, like they always do at every G8 summit and G20 summit, and gee, I wonder why people are so angry. If, 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 big, movement, if big movements start forming and they start arming themselves, like they should, because they're ready for revolution or secession, 
the state will increase the violence proportionately, along with the propaganda, of course. The state has many tactics, but its main tool is violence. It used violence to establish the current order. It uses violence every day to carry out the goals of the ruling class. It uses violence to eliminate any challenges to its supremacy. One way or another, the state will try to neutralize any threats to the status quo. That's why it exists. Laws and rights and constitutions provide no protection. Reforms aren't made by us or for us, and we don't enforce them, so why would we think they would work? Because the news makes them sound promising? States are not hemmed in by anything other than physics. I've explained all these claims I'm making in other videos, and you can find links to them in the description. Even during normal times, the police harass, fine, beat, arrest, and in some places, shoot people who are not acting violently. They raid their homes and shoot their dogs. Your Third and Fourth Amendment rights are supposed to protect you against all that, though, aren't they? If not, why do we talk about them at all? They protect you just as much as the First Amendment protects protesters from being thrown into vans. States are occasionally slowed down by lawsuits, but you need a lot of money to launch and sustain one. And even when you are clearly right under the law, that doesn't mean you'll win. The courts are the, the people who authorized all these terrible laws and practices in the first place. They're not your friends. Putting your hopes in the courts to stop the state is a bit like hoping your left hand will stop your brain from doing something. Speaking of hope, if you want to convince me Joe Biden wouldn't deploy federal troops to quell an uprising, I'll need a long essay with multiple citations, please. You can't vote your way out of a police state, just like you can't peacefully march racism away. You can read books and watch videos about how police and military are, are supposed to be separate and have their own special, unique mandates and limited scopes and different, they have different codes of conduct and the law restricts their actions. You can learn all about how Customs and Border Patrol aren't supposed to have the kind of power that they're using on the streets of Portland. But it's all just theory theory that, that these videos and books don't want to apply to real life because they're afraid of what it'll reveal, that the state does not operate along theoretical lines. It responds to what it perceives as threats by the many means at its disposal. That includes propaganda, again. There's propaganda that's obvious if you think about it, like the DHS's whole violent anarchists nonsense. But there's also propaganda most of us assume is true without ever examining it. I consider it propaganda that states are supposed to protect your rights, and the many constitutions and charters and laws that talk about rights are examples of such propaganda. I consider every use of the word democracy to describe government propaganda. We really need to get past the illusions, the, the words like freedom and democracy that we just assume are true and mean something. We need to get past them beyond, see beyond these illusions that they've set up for us and start realizing we've been under occupation this whole time. It's just that we're used to it. When you don't move, you don't notice your chains. One of the state's tools is to project an image of invulnerability, to convince us that it's no use fighting back. Well, the good news in all of this that we've seen is the cracks are showing in the edifice of that illusion.
it's crystal clear from their tactics that the people in power consider this uprising a threat to their power. They'll always push back until they're overthrown. But if enough people are united and organized and they keep pushing, they'll win.